<coughs> okay, we're gonna start. So, dear colleagues, members of ERSA and of uh, RSAI, uh, participants or uh, attendants, my name is Andre Torre, I'm the president uh, of ERSA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and to declare open the 16th Congress of ERSA on Territorial Futures. 2021 is a year of recovery for ERSA. Due to the COVID pandemics and to the subsequent events, and like many other associations, we had a hard time in 2020. But we succeeded in organizing a very appreciated uh, organized Congress in August 2020 online and then uh, events online. Contrary to many uh, scientific associations, ERSA has proceeded to be resilient and resistant, but also very innovative and very inventive. All of our events this year have been virtual, including two very successful schools at by the GRC team from Sevilla in January and from the University of Groningen team in June, and also the DG Regio lectures, the OCD webinar, the ASA COVID battle, all those events have been held virtually. And it will be also maybe the case of several events to come, like uh, the European Week of Regional Cities in October. The 16th ERSA Congress was first uh, scheduled to be held in Bolzano in Italy. But due to the pandemic, of course, we have been obliged to cancel and to have an on-site event and, and to organize an online event. So the 16th Congress is fully online and it has a very rich content. So I will share my screen in order to give you some hints and some stats. Can you see it? Yes, okay. So if you um, have a look at the Congress, you can see that it has a very rich uh, content starting with the keynote lecture of Daniela Jacob in a few minutes, uh, it, who, who will be chaired by Andrea Omizolo, and then uh, other uh, keynote like Tom Brockel on the use uh, of news, and it will be uh, an RSPP uh, lecture. Then Cesar Hidalgo on economic complexity, Laura Resmini on spillovers and foreign direct in the investment, Andres Rodriguez Pose on the economic cost of solitude, and uh, finally, Rosella Nicolin on population distribution across space, which will be Peer's uh, lecture. Three uh, major roundtables are also scheduled, uh, namely the IRSA GRC roundtable on multifaceted innovation for territorial post COVID responses in two parts smart territories and innovative cities. Then the OECD roundtable on green transitions in region from COVID to green, multi sustainable future. And then the Polymy roundtable on justification, objectives, and regional uh, policies. But most of all, we have an outstanding number of presentations because this year we have more than 800 um, participants and more than 700 presentations. So if we look at the type of events, we have this year 100 special sessions, 82 ordinary sessions, few referred sessions, keynote and roundtables, and also nine scientific sessions. We are very proud of that, and Evelyn Van Leuven will come back uh, to this soon. Um, during the Congress, you could move to another session, or to one session to another, whenever you want. You can exchange 
you can network during the pauses, and also you can attend to an evening meeting with the editors of the three journals of the RSCA, namely Peers, RSPP, and Region. And most of all, if you are a presenter, you can receive and you will receive a recording of your presentation that you could share whenever you want and whatever you want. In terms of um, participants, we are very proud to say that we are quite balanced in terms of, of uh, gender issues. And also that um, we are quite young, if I can say, in terms of demography. So are a few, here are a few slides regarding the demography of um, the, the Congress. In a few seconds, in a few minutes, I will leave the floor to several persons. First, Andrea Umizolo of the, of the Local Organizing Committee, Roland Psenner, president of Iorak Research, Roberta Capello, the president of ISRE, the Italian uh, ERSA Association, and Evelyn Van Leuven, vice president of ERSA. But first of all, I would like to say a few words and to pay tribute to um, rem remembrance of two great European leaders who left us this year. First one is Antoine Bailly. So Antoine Bailly from the University of Geneva was the former president of Regional Science Association International, president of the Western Regional Science Association, and also president of a French speaking section of ERSA. He was also the winner of the Notre Dame Prize which is considered as the Nobel Prize in Geography. And he received the Founders Medal of RSCI for his lifetime contribution to the field of regional science. Antoine was especially known for his contribution in social geography and in health domain and in many other domains as well. I want also to pay tribute to Ake Anderson, who died recently. Um, Ake was from the John Shopping International Business School, and he received in 2005 the very prestigious ERSA Prize in Regional Science for his outstanding career, and also in 1995, the ONDA Prize for his work on dynamic analysis in the field of regional economics and regional planning. So I wanted to share you um, our concern with that and to share our uh, the loss of this great person. Now, I think I have finished my introductory uh, talk and then I leave the floor to Andrea Omizolo from the LOC for a few minutes. Thank you, Andre. Good morning and welcome. A warm welcome also from my side. I'm really sorry I cannot welcome you this year in person in Bolzano in Italy. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, uh, not permit uh, to, to welcome you uh, in person, but uh, maybe in one next year uh, could be uh, we, um, we, we can host you uh, in person uh, um, for a Congress. Um, I wish you, to all of you, a good Congress and see you in, during the sessions. Thank you, Andrea. Now I give the floor to Roland Psenner, the president of URAC Research. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, uh, a warm welcome to URAC Research. You know, we have been waiting impatiently for the sixth ESA Congress. The last two years have shown us again how urgently we need a transformation towards a more resilient society. Therefore, I'm very happy that we finally can meet, although mostly online, here in Bolzano. I think that 
Iraq is a fine place for a discussion about territorial futures, visions, and scenarios for a resilient Europe. Allow me to say a few words about Iraq research. We are about 550 people working in 11 institutes and five centers on topics as different as, for instance, applied linguistics, minority rights, alpine environment, federalism, biomedicine, renewable energy, to name just a few disciplines. And not to forget, of course, the Institute of Regional Development. It's the home base of Andrea. The richness of diversity is the paradigmatic motto of URAC. As an ecologist, I'm convinced that we need a transdisciplinary approach to create a more resilient society. And this comprises ecology as well as economy, science and visions. Therefore, I wish to thank the organizers, the eminent speakers and all participants of the sixth ERSA Congress. Good luck. Thank you, Roland. Now I give the floor to Roberta Capello, president of the ISRE, the Italian section of ERSA. So thank you very much, André. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, Italy and to Bozen. Uh, on behalf of the of ISRE, uh, the Associazione Italiana di Scienze Regionali, the Italian section of the Regional Science Association International, uh, I am really glad that we are uh, together again, even if uh, in digital in a digital way. Um, unfortunately, I would say, because I am not far from Bozen today, and we have a wonderful sunshine and the wonderful mountains around, so you would have for sure uh, enjoyed uh, the landscape and the, uh, especially the social atmosphere. Uh, as Andrea said, we are not going to give up. Uh, uh, as uh, ISRE, uh, as Italian section uh, of ERSA and RSAI, we will uh, beat again <laughs> to uh, get uh, ERSA conference again in Italy, host an ERSA conference again in Italy, hopefully not so far from uh, today. So um, I, have, I want to, in any case, to thank URAC and the local organizing committee, Andrea Omizzolo first, because they spent a lot of time. Probably uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the organization of a digital conference is as complicated as, a, 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 well, it provides problems uh, and that have to be uh, faced uh, that are uh, as as in in the case of a, of in presence. So I there is a lot of work behind this uh, event, and I would like to thank uh, again Andrea Mitzelo and uh, Jurak uh, Ronald Petzner again for try doing this twice eh? because this is the second time <laughs> we tried last year. We hoped to get it this year, and again, we couldn't make it. So uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you also to ERSA. Uh, as, as a member of ERSA, I am delighted to see how much, uh, uh, well, I, I'm delighted to see the richness, uh, the scientific richness of the conference and the size of the conference. Uh, so we haven't given up to have a very large conference, even if online. So I'm sure it will be, in any case, a successful event. Thanks again to everybody who put their time and effort uh, to get this great event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roberta. Now I give the floor to Evelyn van Leeuwen, the Vice President of ERSA. Thank you very much, André. And I would also add to uh, the other speakers that I would really like to welcome you to this ERSA conference. And I'm uh, with, uh, with Roberta and André, and André are very happy and also proud that so many registered, many people registered for this conference. And also had a, that we made a very good and interesting program indeed, but also from your side that you said, okay, I'm going to contribute to the conference. I'm going to submit my presentation and work on my research and do an effort to keep also ERSA alive. And, and indeed we are very much alive 
uh, with such a great conference. And I would also particularly like to welcome uh, the young scientists. Uh, on Thursday, we have the young scientist session. We have nine uh, sessions uh, with uh, all um, young speakers uh, who will have dedicated discussions and, and senior very good um, chairs of their sessions. And several of them will um, run for the finest prize, our most prestigious uh, young scientist prize. Uh, and I wish you a very, very good conference and very good sessions. And I would also um, encourage you to network as much as possible, even though it's not so easy uh, online, but try to catch up with people you know, with people you met at the summer school, at the RSA GRC summer school, at the Groningen summer school we had last June, uh, to, um, to broaden your network. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions or to be a bit critical because we can use all the fresh ideas. Uh, and all the insights uh, from you as well. So uh, a very warm welcome to everyone uh, and I wish you and us a great conference. So thank you very much, Evelyn. I think we are close to the end of the opening. The only thing I could say to everybody is welcome, have a nice Congress, please interact, please ask questions. We have tried to prepare the best lineup what we can do. And uh, I think uh, it's great. And we have, uh, you have a lot of opportunities to present your research, to, to, re to exchange, to receive comments. So enjoy the Congress. And now we start really to work. And I give the floor to uh, Andrea Omizzolo and to Daniela Jacob for our first keynote in plenary session. So thank you, Andre. Let's start. The pandemic of 2020 has changed the world. This is a fact. However, Europe is also experiencing several other challenges, which have significant impacts on the resilience of society and territories. Now, becoming more resilient is even more important, but the megatrends we are facing are challenging and have to be considered in the right way. Some of these issues are well known, others are partly unexpected, but all of them involve challenges, in particular social and environmental ones, that any kind of territory has to face. Some of them are due to human activities, which are modifying the physical, ecological, and biological components of the environment to fit the needs of society, often causing severe effects and deposing an existential risk to ecosystems and therefore to humanity. One key issue is the acceleration of global climate change. The impacts are becoming more and more tangible, particularly in rural, mountain, fragile and marginal areas. Especially in recent years, extreme events have been more frequent and unfortunately also several urban areas are experiencing these effects. From my point of view, political, social, and cultural processes and physical landscape responses in different areas and regions determine, determine um, the intensity of these impacts. Furthermore, different cultural groups, political and economic entities view, react, and impact these human environmental processes in different ways. I think we need to better understand and to integrate in our works this challenging issue. Therefore, we ask to Professor Daniela Jacobs to open our Congress by highlighting some key points that will be considered very important for the regional science community in Europe. Because it's time to act now. Daniela, PhD in meteorology, is head of the Climate Service Center in Germany and visiting professor at the Leuphana University. She was a lead author of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC, and coordinating lead author for the IPCC special report in global warming of 1.5 degrees. She's member of several committees and ex-official member of the Earth League, an international alliance of prominent scientists from world-class research institutes. Her research interests focus on regional climate modeling, 
the hydrological cycle, adaptation to climate change and climate services. I think <laughs> very interesting topic and the person, the right person in the right place. Daniela, we are very honored to have you uh, on board and with us here today. Thank you for your time. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, Andrea also for this uh, very nice welcome words. And uh, I must say first, I'm very honored to be here and uh, share my ideas and thoughts with you. Uh, I think the uh, Ursa is a very, very interesting uh, group of people, um, large group of people, um, which I do think have the, the capabilities, the, the, the um, means to tackle the challenges which are ahead of us, as you just mentioned. I would have liked to be there in person, of course, uh, to meet with you and, and uh, also to network a bit more than it's possible in this way. On the other hand, we have saved quite a lot of CO2 emissions uh, by this. Um, hopefully, we're using renewable energies to feed our Zoom uh, electricity demands here, but uh, I think we are on a good track. So I share my screen with you. Um, I hope it works. So, uh, Andrea, can you? Okay, I see you yes. nodding. So okay. good. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so um, today I would like to uh, talk a little bit about why it's time checked. I mean, we heard it already by uh, by Andrea's words. We are living in a changing climate. And this, of course, puts challenges on us. Uh, one, of course, is that we have to deal with the already changed climate. And what does it mean? Uh, climate is nothing else than the statistics of weather. So the weather is changing. The weather is changing almost everywhere. And this means we are affected on our day, in our day-to-day -day life by weather, as you know. The, on the other hand, we, um, we have heard and learned that the global warming is rising tremendously and uh, the um, International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, mentioned quite often that we cannot adapt to all warming levels. So the second challenge is to mitigate climate change. And that is why I want to say a few words about where are we at the moment. So currently, um, here you can see the, uh, on the left side the CO2 rise in the atmosphere, and in March 2021 we reached 418 ppm. This is too much. On the right side you see at the same time the uh, increase of the methane in the atmosphere, and the highest concentration was at the end of 2020. So we are living in a change, changing climate, in a changing atmosphere. The conditions of the, the uh, uh, substances in the atmosphere are changing. At the same time we have learned from climate science what is the attributable human-induced part of the global, global warming. In the last 10, 15 years, the attribution research was, um, was developed, which actually can tell you the um, probability of specific events um, being more often in uh, uh, under changing conditions, under changing climate conditions. But at the same time, we also learned that the, the warming, and you can see it here in the rising curve, the, you can see the, the uh, yellow curve is human induced warming and, and it starts to really uh, um, accelerate in around 1970 roughly. The, um, the blue curve, the uh, round zero is the natural warming and cooling. So the, in, the year to year variability of course is visible, also decay variability is visible, but the pickup here of the um, global warming index, which are actually aggregated observations. So there's nothing on scenarios or modeling in it. It is the observed uh, curves. So you see 
how the warming has uh, increased. And let me have a quick look at Germany here, just as an example, and you could go to your own regions and territories and see that the, the 10 warmest years in Germany were, were all in the last decades. And, uh, and you can really see by the, the, the hotter it gets, the redder it gets, and that's always in my figures. Um, the, the hotter it gets, the more red is the color. So globally, European-wide and locally, climate is changing. On the other hand, we know, and we are just uh, uh, just before the next COP, the Convention of the Parties, that we have to, uh, as in the Paris Agreement agreed, we have to limit global warming as much as possible. And the Paris Agreement is here in this green uh, um, uh, little part of the, of the temperature uh, measurement um, instrument here. So that is where the 1.5 degree um, agreement of Paris would sitting 1.5 degree above the pre-industrial um, average, of course. So um, the pledges, the current pledges are around uh, three degrees. The current policies are around three degrees. So even if we look at optimistic targets from the climate action tracker, which is a very good source to look at if, you, if you're interested in the newest numbers, uh, says that with the optimistic targets which politicians are currently discussing, we will end up by the end of this century, 2100, uh, plus about two, a bit more than two degrees warmer than prior to industrialization. So this is fact. This is where we are. Why is it so important? It is so important because we will all face changes in a warmer world. The 1.5 degree report in 2018 has stated for the first time that from the observations, we could see that in several regions of the world, the extreme events like heat waves, droughts, and heavy precipitation uh, were changing either in frequency, duration, or intensity in several regions of the world and significantly, statistically significantly uh, analyzed. In a time period of about 50 years, and that time period was 1960 to 20, uh, 2010, which was equivalent to about half a, degree, half a degree of warming. So in a time period of half a degree of warming, uh, the extreme events, the three which I mentioned, have changed in several regions of the world. It's very likely that with another half degree of warming, those extreme weather events will further change. And if you look at this figure here, it is actually a way of, of an example how you can, how you can uh, um, make visible uh, what is affecting you. And I'm, I'm actually today go through several examples of the, the knowledge which we have to make it easily graspable for the diversity of people and stakeholders to discuss with. So you see in red here, these are the areas in Europe with high population density. Then the dark blue here, this is where we expect in a half degree warmer world by the end of the century, we expect more tropical nights. And where it's green, it is where we expect in summer, in June, July, and August, heavy precipitation days, days, more days with heavy precipitation. So you can see in these overlapping colors, um, the white, the yellow, and the purple, where more than two, two or three of those conditions are coming together. So if we, if we look here at Spain, for example, we have high population density and we do have more tropical nights. So let's go to the next level and let's go to two degree warming. If you now look at and focus a little bit at this uh, pink uh, color here, you will see in many areas here in Italy, uh, in, in uh, 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 I would say central to Southern Europe, that um, in areas with high population density, more tropical nights are projected. And if you look at these very first uh, bluish colors here, where two of the extremes come together, more tropical nights and more precipitation in summer, that is probably where the Netherlands and, and, and uh, uh, Northern France is located. And if we, look at a three degree world, it is even much stronger. So you can see here, the regions where at least two of those extremes are coming together are 
heavily increasing. So this is an example for you to think about and to pick those figures when you talk to your politicians and to your stakeholders and when you go further with the discussion. A second way is we have looked at the winners and losers. So in a two degree warmer world, this is a bit old, it's a bit from uh, 2014, but it's still valid. So we have looked at different conditions like droughts, cooling, crop yield, and uh, have investigated um, is there a, an increase in yield or is it a decrease in yield? So is there, is there a winner or is it a loser? Is, is it, is it a, um, a negative impact or is it a positive impact? And unfortunately, you can see that the winner's hotspots are more or less in the north and the loser's hotspots, where more than one of those conditions come together, um, are more in the central and in the south of Europe. So all of Europe, all regions, all territories are affected. And if we come to the, um, to the impacts now under, under a, a very, very strong scenarios, which is more than four degrees, um, then here from the um, COACH project, which is a very interesting project, it's a very good source to look at, uh, you can see again that within Europe, different regions have different um, uh, face different challenges here on changes in temperature and heat rates on productivity. And that, of course, is associated with costs. So some few examples of sectoral economic costs here, for example, European flood impacts on transport, direct impacts only in Europe and no adaptation. Uh, here are some numbers giving tremendously large numbers on a medium warming and a strong warming. And if you're interested in this, then go to this coach project website or go to the, to the information and look at the damages, the European river flood damage costs, for example, again, for different um, possible storylines with different warmings. And you see, of course, the, the, by the mid uh, or the end century, if you look at the middle here, the warmer it gets, the more costs it will have. And um, the coastal damage, again, if you look at the very lowest uh, line here, you can see uh, uh, with the, about uh, two degree warming only, we are in the range by the end of the century between 300 and uh, uh, 356, uh, 60, uh, 65 and uh, 795 uh, billion per year with a much stronger warming, we, uh, we might uh, reach um, uh, two point, um, uh, 2,400 billion uh, per year. So these are tremendous differences with a uh, degree of warming. And um, now let's see what actually is adaptation helping us. Adaptation, I said at the beginning, adaptation is what we are currently um, subsumizing under how can we protect our lifestyle, our lives, our regions, our sectors, um, um, against uh, harm due to global warming. So we are adapting to the new type of weather, to the new weather variability. We are adapting to um, the challenges. And if you look into this to adaptation from, for example, river fl uh, floods uh, by the end of the century, by 1.5 degree warming, two degree warming or three degree warming, um, then you see that there are, the damage is between 24 uh, billion per year and 48, and uh, with no adaptation, and it's only eight uh, if you adapt. So if you protect what you can protect. And if you look at people being exposed, this is uh, thousands per year, there are tremendous numbers, 482, and it's only 90 uh, in thousands per year. Um, uh, people being exposed and similarly to by coastal flooding. But it is not possible to adapt to all changes. That is also very clear. This figure it looks nice, but it is not the full story because we do know that we cannot adapt to all warming levels. It is, uh, there will be thresholds which will, which will change the regional and, and uh, global climate. And, uh, and it is impossible to adapt to all risks. So we have to do both. We have to mitigate climate change as much as possible 
and at the same time to adapt to what we cannot avoid anymore. And the information is there. What I show you is another example here. For example, the winter precipitation increase. So if you want to have a very, very easy uh, uh, map to discuss, then you can use this kind of signal maps, which tells you, yes, there is a change in your region and you, it, the change is larger than 15%, for example, and you have to pay attention and get adapted to this. Or you can say, oh, my region is green, all fine, the change is below 10%, 10, uh, 10% uh, for example. My message here is, it is not that we do not know what is ahead of us. We know exactly what is ahead of us. We know that climate is changing in all regions. And actually here, as an example, from global to European to local to community level, the information is around. You can get it from us. You can get it from the weather services. You can get it on a six or eight kilometer raster in France. You get it in a kilometer in Scandinavia and the UK. You get it on a kilometer raster in Austria. So uh, go to your, your uh, weather services, or if you have no contact, contact me and I will put you in contact with those who have the data. The information on the local changes is around. Here, for example, our um, climate outlooks for our counties in, as you see here in Germany, we have 441 counties and we present the changes of the 17 the most important climate uh, indicators to them because each city, each village, each sector has different demands. The adaptation needs are depending on your local characteristics, on your local vulnerabilities, and uh, but the climate change information is around and can be can be used for this. And um, so the point is, I have two more. Um, two more slides here, which I would like to share with you. Um, the point is that if we, we protect ourselves, we can already uh, minimize the risk of damage. In addition, as I said before, we unfortunately cannot adapt to everything. And adaptation in, in, uh, in the new world, in the European new settings, also what we discussed in the uh, European Mission Board on um, uh, climate change adaptation and societal transformation is not only adapting to the new weather, it is adapting to the new lifestyle. And I will come to this in a minute. So I think what you, what you do with the Congress is very important, sharing expertise. Uh, now, and actually you, you might be surprised, but in the agricultural adaptation in the northern part of Germany is now discussing irrigation. And that is, of course, something which you in the southern parts of, of Europe, you know already. I mean, you, you, you do this since, I, I would say, almost centuries, um, the regional adaptation. And here is a PhD student of mine looked at the um, effect of uh, once or twice uh, um, per, per uh, production uh, phase or irrigation. And even if you irrigate in the future, in the middle of the century, you can compensate for approximately 30% of crop failure. This is only true for this northern part of Germany. But it is an example for you. It is an example for going back to what we have learned in the past. We have experiences from our, from our uh, um, cultural uh, uh, development in the regions, in the territories, uh, over hundreds of years, and uh, and the regions had to adapt to always new uh, challenges and changes. And we know a lot of the past. Now we also know what is ahead of us, so we know what how the climate might be and look like in the future. And we have to bring this together now. So the challenge of politicians and decision makers is now not only to decide on what they know from the past and, and, and the current setting, but also take into account what they know about the future. They cannot say, we, we cannot say we did not know what is ahead of us. And in this setting, the integrative modeling and the integration of stakeholders, be it farmers, chamber of agriculture, water unions, political decision makers, the civil society, bring them together, discuss the best setting, discuss the visions for the territories, for the regions, for a resilient, sustainable, climate neutral 
and adapted, climate adapted life in a region. And I think this system thinking is what also the COVID pandemic unfortunately showed us how important it is to bring all those aspects together and think in the system and have democratic ways to discuss and negotiate the best ways and the side effects, which of course are often there. So let me go to the blue and green infrastructure because I think that is really important. I haven't talked much about cities, but adaptation in cities and um, uh, is, is really far already uh, advanced. And uh, we know a lot about the, 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 um, uh, the opportunities which uh, blue and green infrastructure gives us to take care of an urban water cycle, to limit the heat in the cities, which of course is a problem for health. So um, the city as a system, as a cross-sectoral system, is affected by weather variability in many different ways. It could be um, in the uh, um, transport infrastructure, could be in the water and energy infrastructure. And depending on the setting, the solution, the adaptation solutions connected with the mitigation solutions have to be discussed and implemented. And many of the solutions are around from experiences, best practices. You can see them in the EEA and, in, and you can share them. Um, so we know the climate ahead of us. We know many, many of the solutions. We need the means to implement the solutions in the setting of the individual territories. And that are the responsibilities, the challenges and the restrictions. And, and I'm very close to end my, my talk here because I would like to get in, in dialogue with you. And, um, and I think the, um, uh, the, 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 the question which we have is we do have here on the, uh, it's on my, my right side, um, we do have the knowledge about the climate, the past, what has changed, and how it will change in the future. So we do have the knowledge about um, how the weather will be in the future. We have a lot of information on the impacts. And as I said before, the impacts can be very different in the regions, could be wildfires, it could be flooding, could be extremes, but it could also be slow changing conditions, which are more difficult to grasp, which also have to be considered and, and um, discussed. And then this is what we know. So now where's the problem? The problem is the responsibilities are very strongly distributed. So we have responsibilities in the regions, in the cities, in the districts, at the, at the federal states. We have the European Union, which is important for us to understand where to go. It's a guiding, I would say, guiding principles. You have seen the climate, the um, climate change uh, adaptation strategy, the European adaptation strategy. There is the, the forest strategy, the water strategy, um, the, the horizon the euro program, the research programs uh, feeds into those areas where the research is needed to, uh, to fill gaps. Um, I think we still have some knowledge gaps. We have uh, knowledge gaps in different areas, but also how to connect all those sectoral um, demands and questions and how to connect from the global to the local, um, to the local settings. And in these responsibilities makes, makes it of course complex and difficult to act. But, um, I think it is very clear, and you, as um, as uh, Elsa, you are working along those lines. We need systemic views, systemic research, and systemic solutions uh, within a very complex legislative framework. So uh, it is very important to bring together natural scientists, social scientists, um, uh, economists, civil society, policy. So uh, we cannot. We cannot leave decisions to a part of, uh, of the stakeholders or to policy. It is us who is in responsibility. And of course, what we are looking for is to, to look at those different settings here. So 
Connecting smart, connected smart cities, yes, interesting, a good idea, a smart city. But if you look at a smart city from an energy point of view, you would build the city in a way that it's as dense as possible so that you save energy. If you look at a smart city from a uh, from a um, adaptation climate change point of view, you would give the city room to cool. You need a lot of green in the city, you need water in the city, you need those parts where in the city the fresh air can come in over, overnight and exchange the, the used air um, which, uh, which was used over the day. So, the, um, so there's a challenge to connect climate mitigation and climate adaptation in cities. The win-win solutions are not so obvious on, in this uh, uh, city energy setting. And if we also think about smart cities, then we often think about um, energy use and uh, having everything digital, digital and automatic. But um, there's a lot of energy demand behind this digitalization. Uh, it will give you a lot of new options. But if the energy demand cannot be limited to that what is definitely needed, we will not be able to only feed our energy demand by renewable energies. And that is what we have to do. We have to step out of fossil fuels as soon as possible, urgently, because we will not be able to, um, to, um, uh, to adapt to this very, very strong warming. And um, so the climate protection is very important um, to, to have in all, our, in all the decisions which we have to make and take now think about it, is it harming climate? Is it adapted to climate change? So these ideas of how is our life affected in, uh, in, in, in our day-to-day -day activity affected by weather and climate is something which we have to mainstream in our decisions in a way that we come up to, to have a sustainable environmental protection. So, um, the idea is to, to uh, uh, now initiate a new era, a new um, age of time. So the, um, the idea is to, and that's what we say, it's a Paris lifestyle, is to think a little bit about implementing the Paris Agreement. So let us limit global warming to not more than two degrees, ideally below two degrees, but in a way, that it is that we have a Paris lifestyle, which is a lifestyle which is sustainable, which is climate neutral, which is, uh, it, but it's also prosper, safe and fair and just. And so the, and also easy, that's why we say Paris lifestyle, a little bit this easygoing Paris lifestyle, which, uh, uh, which we all would like to have. And uh, I think that is really, what we have to have in our minds, and it is urgently needed to start mitigating climate change. So before I will finish now, and I think I will come to my last slide here, I think it is very clear that it is on us. It is on us to uh, mitigate global warming. So uh, once I talked to the mayor of Hamburg and he asked me, what should they do? And, uh, and I said, yeah, why don't you make a challenge out of it? And make a little competition for the different parts of the city. And by the end of the year, or by the beginning of the year, they say, we are aiming to limit our environmental footprint or our climate footprint or our, or our emissions by 10% in the coming year. And, uh, and then the next part of the city says, um, well, we will probably be able to do it by 15%. And then there's a, bit, a little bit of a battle, a challenge, um, amongst those areas in, um, in Hamburg and then give them uh, some present, some the winner, the winner takes it all, that's how it is. So uh, try to, to make, to initiate um, uh, um, citizen engagement in a way that the citizens understand that the, the, the need to limit global warming, to limit emissions is important, but it, it's not done by restrictions from someone else. It's not that you have to adapt to something which someone else is telling you. It is you. You can either decide I'm not flying anymore 
or I fly once to in my vacation time, but then I will not use my car anymore and use a bike, a bicycle to go to work. So, so there are many options, and it is clear in, the impact of climate change is on all those areas. It it is we have to limit the impact of climate change for our environment. We need our environment. We need the forest. We need nature for recreation. We need biodiversity. It is for us humans. It is important to, um, to, uh, uh, to limit the impact of climate change uh, for us as humans, for our economy. Economy is influenced by, by, uh, uh, by the um, um, uh, supply chains. Uh, if there is a disaster, a, a storm in, in Asia, for example, where you usually get your, your goods, which you build your, your products off from, uh, it will harm your economy. And we have learned this in the pandemic very strongly. Uh, we have to limit um, the climate change impacts because it impacts also our infrastructure. It is impacting our way of life. And it, of course, impacts our habitats. So we have to limit climate change and to get to adapt to what we cannot change anymore for the well-being of the next generation. And it is in our hands to act now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. <laughs> Inspiring words, I think. <laughs> and we have a lot of questions, uh, but uh, first, I think uh, it's time to uh, to answer some questions from our colleagues. First, uh, there are question a question from um, Evelyn. He said concerning the winners and losers, France is um, an interesting case, being cut in the middle. Are that also places where we can expect most discontent and, and social uh, unrest? Or would uh, you expect, uh, um, expect it to take place more uh, at the EU divide? Yeah, yeah so uh, thank you for the question. So first of all, um, Evelyn, this is of course uh, an analysis which only takes into account a few of the conditions. And the, we have picked conditions which are important for all of Europe. So if a, if a region has regional characteristics which will stabilize the region, it, it is not in this, in this picture. It was more kind of an example of um, how you can look at uh, the European level where um, extreme conditions come together and, and as, as multi-hazards or as, as multi-risks. And of course, there is, um, there is uh, both what you said. I, I do think we have to be aware of the north-south gradient in Europe, but also the west-east or east-west gradient in Europe, which under climate change is, uh, will be strengthened in different conditions. So uh, the droughts are, uh, are one of those which are harming uh, regions very differently. And of course, also, as you pointed to France, um, yes, I also think it, it can also be um, uh, within a region, a risk of disconnect. And, uh, and I think that's important to, to have in mind, but, but be careful with my numbers here, because the regional characteristics are much more important um, and I think it would need along those lines, and I'm sure there are uh, more detailed studies, but, but yes, it is both. It's on the European and on the regional scale. There is another question from Victor. Uh, you find the whole concept of winning and, uh, a bit relative, especially when considering potential dynamic population and economic response and fallout. Uh, what is the notion behind winning in this concept? Yeah, Victor, um, thank you very much for this uh, question. You're fully right. Uh, the notion for this was to wake up politicians. That's why that was why we we created this type of figure. Um, it was uh, created in an EU project called Impact to See. Uh, so uh, we were asked to um, to look at the impact under two degree in Europe because at that time that was in the in the early uh, 2010s more or less. 
um, there was still the question, uh, uh, will Europe be at all being impacted by, by climate change uh, uh, if we would limit global warming below two degree or at two degree? And um, so this was a very, I would say, a catchy way uh, of, of course, solid statistics and simulation in the back and science, but, um, but it, is, uh, it is a very kind of a simple Away. Um, I wanted to show it to you, you here because um, in the last weeks and months, I, I, I think we, we heard a lot, at least in Germany, on uh, we did not know. We do not know where the data are. We do not know what the impact is. We have to find the context. But we know. We know where the data are. We know what is ahead of us. We know what to do. And that is why I wanted to, to use those uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I would say um, um, European wide examples. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Daniela. Another question from Roberta. Uh, how have the scenarios been built? Are they the result of an extrapolation of past trends or have other assumptions be, uh, been inserted, like the new technologies, up to, um, adoptions, and so on? Yeah. yeah, so the scenarios are uh, climate modeling scenarios. All data I showed uh, related to scenarios are results from uh, global and regional climate modeling. And the climate modeling functions in the following way. The climate model is, is kind of a computer model of, uh, of the Earth, the global climate model. It has... Um, it is like an image of uh, like, like a digital twin, more or less, of the Earth. It has uh, um, oceans, atmosphere, land, soil, uh, settlements, vegetation, everything on it. It's like a weather model, it's similar. And it has a grid. And on, uh, in the, on this uh, uh, grid cells, you, we will compute the uh, weather variables, like how warm is it, how much does it rain, how much wind is there, and so on. And um, since the scenarios for the future uh, need some assumptions, the climate change scenarios are if then um, ways to look at. So if we would uh, leave a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, the climate can change very strongly. If we have green technology, the climate will not, uh, the emissions are less and the climate changes less. So in this way, through our assumptions on uh, regional emission scenarios, which are dependent on demography, um, uh, development of technology and um, uh, land use change, uh, some of what you uh, mentioned here, assumptions like new technologies are included. But it is the state of, I would say, five to, yeah, about five years ago. So if we now look at the artificial intelligence and the demands from artificial intelligence, they are not included in those uh, scenarios. So that will come into the next round of scenarios. Expressed in greenhouse gas release or change of land use, which is change in, for example, urban areas in in uh, settlements and so on, yeah. The mic, okay. Uh, Leori does um, ask if uh, uh, um, there are also other uh, causes for the climate change, like for example, uh, the solar activity. There is a debate I think in uh, uh, ongoing, no? Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, there is uh, still a debate ongoing, but there are also very clear articles shown that the solar activity can only account for uh, roughly one third of the of the change in temperature. So the the when we do climate change scenarios over many centuries or even uh, uh, thousands back back, we what what we do with our climate models is we first. Um, simulate the past to make sure that the the climate models are not calibrated. They are built out of um, uh, physical and, and mathematical uh, formulas, ex uh, processes, putting into formulas, putting into the numerical code. And then they, we, we compute the past, and then we compare this to the observed information which we have. Could be sediments, could be temperature measurements, different kinds. 
And uh, so there's also as one of the drivers is at the top of the atmosphere is the income of solar radiation. And we, of course, know what we know about the variability of the in input into the atmosphere of solar radiation. That's in the climate scenarios. It is taken into account. And it is about, as I said, about one third. It's about 0.3 to 0.4 degree, but not more. Now uh, are coming some questions <laughs> uh, about the European. For example, it's time to shift from a smart city to a resilient city concept. Yes. Smart city is an, an old concept. Yeah, uh, I mean, a smart city <laughs> is part. I would say it's part, but, it, but if smart is not resilient, it makes no mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. We have to integrate but, but resilience a smart city also concept into a resilient smart city concept. Yeah. yeah, but let's talk about resilience. I don't know exactly. Okay. So what do you, what do you, uh, what is your definition about resilience? I mean, resilience okay. is cannot be frozen in a way that we have mm -hmm. to be resilient to whatever disaster is coming. Uh, resilience must also be in, a, in the uh, transformative uh, uh, thinking. So it's not uh, resilient in a way that uh, uh, we build it once and then we have to protect it so that whatever hazard is coming, uh, we are protected. So, I mean, it, it is also a question a bit of, of the, the definition of the resilience, but I'm, I'm not an expert in this. You're much more expert in this. I would join uh, uh, um, <laughs> the question of David, because I'm very interesting on that. Um, I think I can, I can add, uh, according to your experience, um, what about the indirect effects of the acceler acceleration of climate change? For instance, conflicts, migrations, internal and external migrations, uh, institutional uh, deterioration, and so on. And uh, in this regard, David asked, uh, what about the global uh, justice behind the consequence of climate change? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so uh, first of all, I'm not an expert in migration and injustice. So, um, but, um, but I have to say this concept um, of global justice, of course, is extremely important. And uh, I mean, we are, we talked about Europe, but being honest, there are other regions in the world which are even more um, harmed by climate change and uh, who are not as, um, as uh, who do not have the opportunities to adapt uh, to what is already ongoing or even to influence mitigation. So I think the global justice is very important. The indirect effects, um, there are several, there's, there's certain research on, um, on how climatic changes probably enhance reasons for migration, but I do not know enough about this topic if there are uh, reasons, if, there, if climate change would be the only region for migration, a reason for migration. Uh, so uh, I, I know the, uh, uh, what we saw in the 1.5 degree report, uh, you can look into the um, chapter five of the 1.5 degree report. Actually, it's a very interesting report because it looks at, uh, at the, the world in a systemic way from the scenarios and impacts and risks to the adaptation options from a cultural, financial, technological background. And then it comes to the justice. And the um, um, the opportunities, of course, are the, the enabling conditions are, of course, very different. But if um, uh, so, for example, if a migration um, will enhance regional changes is for me unclear at the moment. Um, but we have to uh, we have to say and we know that uh, with the drought in um, in the um, Middle East, uh, we have to expect hundreds of millions of people to move uh, because they cannot survive in the region. That's very clear. Uh, finally, affect also spatial planning yeah. because we need uh, lands for uh, yeah. uh, these new migrants and lands and uh, migrants yeah. for the increasing, the rising of, uh, of the, the, the temperature. Yeah, but, but ideally, of course, in a way that it's not um, uh, sealing the soil again. I mean, not, not, the, the, not in a way that it, it is a lot of cities built in a, in a kind of a um, dense uh, and, and uh, um, 
um, heat island producing style. So um, I, I think it's important, it's spatial planning is extremely important. Um, so to keep the water in the region, for example, the northern part of Germany, over the last hundreds of years, they were they had the tradition to get rid of the water. So they, they wanted to get the water out of their area. And now they are facing drought conditions and they now have to think about how can we keep the water in the region? So what is the rain which is coming in, in fall and winter? How can we keep it for the summer? Which is a completely different cultural setting to the hundreds of years before. And um, But spatial planning is also important. We're currently discussing, and probably you have discussed this too, um, relocation of villages along coasts. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, projects are starting to think about what has to be done to relocate a coastal city 20 kilometer inland or so because of sea level rise. So it, it is a tremendous uh, effort, I think. But it's also, of course, an interesting challenge. Um, yeah. We have a lot of <laughs> a lot of questions for you, uh, but we need to stay uh, on time because uh, other sessions uh, are coming. But okay, um, an observation so far in terms of intensified human wildlife conflicts uh, because of climate change, uh, right? What do, what do you think? Or there are projects based on these three main scenarios presented. Um, I did not get that question. Is it from Nigor? Okay. Christian Remus. Up, oh, sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, so are there so... any observations so far in terms of intensified human wildlife conflicts because of there are yeah. There are. If you look at the IPBES. Uh, a pro uh, a report, um, but I'm not an expert on this. I cannot say much about this. Um, the, okay. um, but I know there are many studies ongoing, and um, and I would recommend to you to if you if you look for IP BESS B E S S, um, and then you find the experts related to this. Unfortunately, I cannot say much about it. Another question from Muhammad. Uh, climate change has been observed since decades. Uh, if we talk about temperature in Asian uh, countries so far is raising day by day. What do you think, uh, what, can be, uh, what can be the reason behind the high uh, raised temperature this year? In particular, I mean, yeah, there are of course different different re uh, reasons for this, and I would have to assess uh, exactly the weather conditions in in uh, in Asia. But what we see this year is that the global circulation has changed more than we have seen before, and as you know, in the northern part of the hemisphere, we have this jet stream which goes mm -hmm. around in. Which you used when you fly from here to Asia, or uh, then it's fast. And if you go the other way around, it takes longer. So, uh, so the the jet stream goes from west to east around uh, around the the, the northern um, the part of the uh, the hemisphere, and um, and that has the speed of this jet stream. It's in about ten to twelve kilometer height. Um, has um, decelerated, and if it's decelerating, it's like like a water flow. It is starting to meander. So if you have less uh, speed, then uh, it breaks into, into curves. And that uh, leads to the fact that instead of the low and high pressure systems just um, going through Europe to Asia and then around the globe, they, there's a flow which meanders. So we have no, now more uh, conditions where we have uh, um, flow from the north to the south or from the south to the north. And that brings, of course, temperatures which are more of a of a tropical um, a condition to to the north. So um, more warm, dry, or or warm and moist conditions to the north, or vice versa. We had also cold outbreaks. So this is okay. uh, is uh, one reason why uh, what's happening this year more often than uh, than expected. Uh, an interesting question from our president <laughs> the, regarding the uh, recent IPCC report. What is your opinion about the development of circular economy as the way to, um, to manage a part of these effects and to start to act at the local and human level? Absolutely important. I, I do think a circular economy is one of the key 
um, drivers um, uh, for uh, towards a more resilient and, uh, and climate uh, neutral way. It will not solve all problems, but it is, of course, looking at, um, at resources, looking at, at uh, energy efficiency and, um, and um, recovery or regeneration of systems. So I do think a circular economy is, is very important um, to, to consider. And also this not uh, very easy is not using this one way uh, uh, plastic tea or coffee uh, uh, mugs. And, and so, so reuse of, of, of goods, reuse of our resources is, is really important. I think um, starting to act on a, a human and local local and human <laughs> human and local level is very important and we should foster this because we can we we saw it in the pandemic um, it is on us it was on us to protect us and others so the 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 individual was very self-efficient so the self-efficiency was very strong and that's the same in climate change if we if we start individual, of course, we need the politi political guidance and settings, but the individual is strong and can, uh, can reach a lot. And new startups with new good ideas in circular economy can also bring the push and, and, uh, and open the door to this new lifestyle in the next, uh, in the next era. Uh, in the light of this, I think uh, Dimitri ask, have a question, a very interesting question. The example of the ongoing pandemic is telling. Uh, there is hardly any efficient European or global coordination. Uh, can we really uh, be optimistic about facing climate change? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you have tough questions for me here today. It's so, not the question, uh, I think, but <laughs> yeah, and I must say, um, uh, I, I think we we learned what I just said. We learned um, if we, that we can have an impact as an individual if we if we stick to the rules. Um, things have changed. If we are not sticking to the rules, things have not, are not changing in the pandemic. So similar is it with climate change. Um, the coordination is a, a, a problem when it comes to, um, to, uh, uh, to the regional and international setting. But I do think that uh, we will not be able to coordinate all adaptation activities and all local and regional activities. And I'm not so sure that that is needed. So I do think a little bit of this bottom up uh, anarchistic uh, development is good. It's better to do it in a not coordinated way than not doing it because we wait for coordination, which will not never be efficient enough. But it's a very, very important question and it needs, of course, more research and, uh, and not a meteorologist look at it <laughs> as a meteorologist. So, so. Julia, uh, another colleague, uh, would like to have a comment about uh, the distinction which is still often made between adaptation and mitigation. Um, Daniela, do you think this difference has to be still considered according uh, to the need for adaptation you can call for? You, you call, sorry, for an uh, I share and the related solution and tools to be implemented and in many cases still identified, created. I think we cannot, uh, I mean, of course, the, the underlying physics and science uh, of adaptation and mitigation uh, says these are very two, two different things, but they have to be seen as the two sides of the same coin. So they, they are very, very closely, uh, closely linked and uh, no um, an adaptation um, option should uh, not also, should increase uh, CO2 um, emissions, for example. So, I mean, it is important to have both and think about both and think about them together and uh, do not distinct, make such a distinction. And as I said before, I think we have to, to, to broaden the word adaptation Adaptation to climate change is not only adapting to weather variability, it is adapting to a new lifestyle. And this climate neutral resilient lifestyle has to be created and it, it needs the cultural settings of the regions of the, uh, of the traditions of uh, uh, and, and, uh, and taking the people on board to jointly develop this forward. 
another question from Yarina. Sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> Some colleagues are coming from different countries. It's difficult to pronounce the name. Uh, thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation. It cannot be enough called into attention. Um, Thank you. I would like to ask you what political elections uh, you as climate specialists would like to see happen to approach the observer problems. Uh, if political attention now uh, tackle an aim at around 3% global warming. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I would like to see more citizen engagement in the mm -hmm. dialogues and in the decisions in, in the regions with their cultural and regional settings. Um, so that it is not uh, the politicians who have to take a decision which society has to, to accept, but there is more dialogue between the civil society or the society at large and, and, uh, and policy. Um, that's one thing. The, the other point is, um, I, I really think we have to act now. So I would like to see... Um, based on the current emissions of an individual region or country, a scenario of decreasing those um, um, uh, emissions every year by five to 10 percent with clear measures behind it, saying, okay, until the end of 22, Bozen, <laughs> Bozen will decrease the, the emissions by 12% and this will be done through this and this and this measure. And the next year we will have another 5% or another 10%. And then uh, with this, having this on, on the different political, um, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, the different, uh, let's say, um, regions where decisions are, are made. So it could be on a city level, could be on a country level, um, but I think it is driven by the individuals who are also pushing for a, um, uh, I would say, a Paris lifestyle for the upcoming generations. And, and I think the, the, we haven't talked much about the intergenerational conflicts and, and risks. And, and what I always say is, um, when I'm, I'm, now, I'm now 60, being mm -hmm. honest. No. And when I grew up, <laughs> so when I grew up, my parents saved a little bit of their money so that I had a bit a better start into university. So they they limit my risk for the future by restricting a little bit uh, uh, or, or restricting their own life or by by taking care at that at that time. Now, often I have the feeling with the climate debate, we are we are um, we are shifting the risk into the future instead of minimizing the risk for the future generations. So I see this as completely contrary to what I experienced. So it is, I think it is on us now to, to uh, be responsible and act so that the risk for the upcoming generations is less instead of more. And currently we are, we are, we are increasing the risk. And I think that is something um, which uh, which I would see by the politicians, which comes here where we need clear action and not saying first we have to find the data, first we have to find the contents, first we have we have to act. And we make mistakes, yes, but we have to act and get the emissions down. That's really important. Shifting to the next generation, our problems is not <laughs> a good solution, I think. Uh, right? Yeah. Uh, there is a question from Roland, strong talk focusing on we know what's happening in the future. Maybe we should be aware of potential unknowns, Gulf Stream, jet, jet, jet stream, wind and water currents in general, and so on. Yeah. Uh, that can uh, exacerbate, exacerbate our counter uh, some of the global temperature effects. Yeah, that yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, there are some unknowns. Um, um, I would say mainly related to tipping points. I would not say the there are there, there are a lot of unknowns about the jet stream per se, but of course uh, jet stream changes under stronger warming. I mean we are currently looking at changes up to eight degree by the end of this century. I mean we talk about two or three. I haven't shown much about eight or ten degrees. So we of course in science we work a lot on those. Um, 
I would say, potential unknowns. There is, of course, more related to methane, uh, permafrost, thawing permafrost, uh, and the unknown of the uh, of the emissions coming from that. Um, uh, it is true that um, they can also counter some of the global temperature effects. I would say they might counter on a regional effect, but not cannot take over the entire global warming. We, for example, in one experiment, we have melted Greenland. Um, so um, within 100 years, by the end of the century. And because with this, you put in fresh water into the, into the North Atlantic, and that is pushing uh, uh, pushing the um, uh, uh, the Gulf Stream and so on and so forth, and uh, but even with that, you will only cool Europe for a couple of decades, 80 deca eight, eight decades or so, and then in 2020, uh, um, 2020, uh, 2200, so 2200 um, in that next uh, century, the warming will uh, will again pick up and accelerate. So there are, of course, those kind of scenarios looked at, but it is true to have these um, uh, partially unknowns in mind and further research and because they can act in both in both directions. It's important. But I do think for our today's uh, decisions, it, it is it is not an excuse to wait. It yeah. is adaptation is, of course, not static. It must be flexible. So if we have new information, we cannot say there's new information and that's why we do nothing. If we have new information, we have to adapt to the new information and take it on board. So it is a it is a moving target, I would say. And uh, <laughs> also, David, uh, replying to you, uh, he said, not only politicians, think about uh, the kilometers uh, you do with your car, the amount of, uh, um, of meat you eat, the plane trips you, may, you take, and so on and so on. We can all make an effort to lower emissions, for example. Uh, I agree, compl I completely agree with, uh, with, uh, with David. Absolutely, uh, me too. Uh, and also, Martin, there are time for one or two questions, and, and <laughs> we end, we are um, on time, but uh, at the end of uh, of um, of the first part. Uh, so you think uh, we still have the chance? <laughs> I mean, we have no, we have no, uh, we we have no other option. I mean, if we want to survive, we have no other option. I mean, it, I mean, it is there is no choice. It it, it is it, it. That's why I do not understand the discussion. It's not either economy or social life. It's not either science or policy. It is all of us jointly. If we want to protect the humans on Earth, we have to act. And I do think we want this. So we have to act, and we have to start now and have the net zero we have to limit our our emissions as much as possible be energy efficient as much as possible uh, we have to change our, our style of work which we're currently doing so we are not flying for a two-hour meeting somewhere uh, anymore i mean that's that's done we are enhancing our night train so next time i come to to madrid maybe with a night train or so so we, we are changing our behavior and i think that's good this is good news and there are lots of new ideas and startups um which uh, where you can show that you can produce jobs we need those climate managers adaptation managers we need the the, the uh, help elderly people in uh, heat situations it's uh, the health we didn't talk about health at all so um, there are uh, so many opportunities for for new jobs for new way of life which is prosper and safe and just and i think it is it is important to to see this uh, positive spirit also behind it at the end a prediction from your uh, from your side <laughs> How oh sorry uh, I lost uh, how many how many here uh, it may take for the global war uh, to be reduced uh, the global sorry um, to reduce the global warming obviously um, if a prediction so, so I, I I do think um, at, that at the, a lot has happened in the last year and the last two years with the emission goals of China, the US and, and others and um, and the coalition of the willing, I would say. Then there are, there are many uh, climate neutral activities in companies in regions. There are, of course, um, difficulties for Brazil, for example, if you have a meat-based in industry um, to find a new 
a, a new way to create your your um, GDP is difficult, or Saudi Arabia which, with fossil fuel. So there are the challenges are very different in different regions of the world. But I do think that we will reach um, the kind of uh, uh, net zero um, in uh, around 2050. And uh, I hope that we are a bit bit faster, but um, but that depends on the on the policy, of course. And we have many other problems at the moment, and uh, and that's of course very difficult to. But but as I said before, uh, we cannot give up. We cannot be too pessimistic. I think we should see the good parts in it and try to bring society into a new trend, which is a climate friendly trend of life. Absolutely. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, thank you for your inspiring words. I think we are at the end of uh, this session. Uh, Andre, please, uh, some word from your side. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks very much, Daniela, for the very, very inspiring uh, words and speech. And there are still questions in the chat, so maybe yeah. you can yeah. try to make answers afterwards. I don't know if you have time, but for our part, we have to close now, and then uh, we have a 15 minutes break, and then we start with the parallel sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, everybody. And now we go to uh, the presentation of everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, thank yeah. you Daniela. Yeah, thank you all very, you much. very much. It was my pleasure. And uh, send me an email if I did not answer your question. I tried to answer via email. Okay, thank you, Brett. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best for the conference.